Writer, director, producer Mark Frost first appeared in the national spotlight as the co-creator with David Lynch of the surreal and groundbreaking television series Twin Peaks. He went on to write and produce a feature film, the critically acclaimed political thriller Storyville, and after a great deal of success in Hollywood, he has recently returned to his first love literature by writing his debut novel, The List of Seven, and we're pleased to have him here. Welcome. Thanks very much. I should also say, you should, you're coming to public television probably with a seven-hour original treatment based on what idea? Well, the idea is that there's a, it's a fictional idea, right? <laughs> we should say up front. It's a, uh, this is not a documentary. No, that there is a top secret research lab somewhere on the East Coast with massively funded that yeah. is uh, trying to determine what happens to the human soul if there is such a thing after we die. And it's what happens inside that company when they make the discovery and what the effect is on the people yeah. involved. This is coming out of your head? Are you writing it? Out of my this? head, yeah. You're, I mean, you're writing it and? And I'll probably uh, produce it and direct it, I would think. Yeah. We'll see. Sometime next year. What is it you most enjoy doing? I like doing whatever occurs to me in the moment. You know, it's it, whatever form it takes it, is usually dictated by the idea itself. Whether it's a book, as this was, whether it's a, a movie, a television show, the, yeah. the idea will tell you the longer that you live with it. And um, you have to listen to that voice. You, you got to hear it, it tells you which direction to go. Exactly. I want to come back to the book, uh, Seven, in a second. But Twin Peaks, what was it about Twin Peaks that you think so galvanize the American attention? Well, there were a couple things. I think we, first of all, had a good mystery story going, which was the initial hook right. to bring people in. I think you we also... a great story. Yeah, yeah, which that, you need, people need that, you know, yeah. as a, they need somebody to hook into in a story. We also, I think, um, kind of broke a, a, a bit of a barrier in that it was a show you actually had to pay attention to. This was not a show you could turn on as background right. music and sort of drift away and, and wait for the commercials. It was a show that if you were going to be rewarded by the show, you had to pay attention. And you had to watch it every week. And that was sort of a, something that television had tried for a while. People looked at it, and, and they looked at some of the other stuff that David Lynch had done, and they, and, and they began to say, what's David Lynch really like, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Yes, they did. And, I, I've been <laughs> and asked who is that. this strange man? <laughs> yeah, well, it Give was, us uh, a little road map here to Mr. Lynch. Well, David is um, uh, by training an artist, you know, yeah. and, a, and it's kind of a surrealist. He's not a, a writer, uh, per se. He, he got into movie making because, as a painter, his canvases started to speak to him, and he needed to make these figures move. <laughs> he heard canvases <laughs> he, in the night, didn't he? He did. There, were, that explains it. It explains a lot. And so he started to animate. He began listen, as an listen animator. to those paintings, David. Oh, no. You, you should see some of the paintings so you'd understand. Um, <laughs> I'd understand Twin Peaks, would I? You might. Well, you might understand a little bit more, yeah. He, uh, he went into animation first, and then from yeah. there, you know, went into to films. Um, but I think he still relates to characters sort of as kind of figments in his mind as opposed to real people. Yeah. I mean, the characters were so skewed that, I mean, that's what made it attractive, too. I mean, people, it yeah. was almost, they were almost surreal. Well, but that also was my experience of small towns. I mean, I yeah. know you've spent time in small towns. Grew I mean, up in one. Yeah. I mean, you will find uh, archetypes like that in every small yeah, town in America. With you. Yeah. I know. I mean, it, every, it, it's amazing yeah. that there, there are characters in every small town. I mean, it's not as simple as saying there's a town drunk and the town this and the town that, but there are characters that have a hold on the imagination of the place. It's a stock company that changes, uh, you know, appearances yeah. like Commedia dell'arte. Yeah, you know, exactly. Everywhere, wherever you go. Yeah. Storyville, a movie I liked a lot because it's political drama and involved sex and murder and violence. I mean, all those kinds of things. Um, is, did you, how'd you come to that, making the film? Um, I had been given a script to rewrite about seven years ago, which I sort of tossed out, but I had always been fascinated by New Orleans, and particularly yeah, by New too. Orleans yeah. politics, yeah. you know, that, that they say down there that um, we're uh, north of the south and south of the north. <laughs> yes. And uh, they also call themselves a kind of banana republic yeah. within the state of Louisiana. Yeah. Um, I remember that my favorite line about it is about New Orleans politics or Louisiana politics was that, that, that the Kennedys grow up at 35 and the Longs go crazy at 35. <laughs> That's pretty good, yeah. <laughs> well, I found some story. I went down and f fished around in, in archives and, and um, libraries and found some historical stories about families that had basically ruled entire counties or parishes yeah, yeah, that sure. fall down there. And I thought, this is the stuff of sort of your basic dramatic situation. And um, combining a couple of those stories, I pulled it together into the story in, in Storyville. Yeah. Now, was it successful, or how successful was it? Or, or well, critically, it was very successful. Yeah, sure it was. It was, a, it was Jason Robobs and James Spader. James Spader, Piper Laurie, a right. lot of good actors. Right. Um, 
the, it was not given a wide release by the studio because by, for some Byzantine reason, the studio that was releasing the movie had no financial interest in the movie. Yeah. Don't ask me to explain why. Oh, uh, but, it's, but since then, it, I, I've had the, the pleasure of having a lot of people see it on video yeah. and now on television and say they really enjoy yeah. it. Is directing as... Tell me about directing, because we've had a lot of very good... Marty Scorsese spent sure. an hour with me the other night, and, mm -hmm. and he is... I mean, I could have gone another hour. He is enormously... He makes film and the craft of directing come alive. It's yeah. like he could look at movies and you would see it in a totally different way yeah. than if you just saw it. I mean, there's six different dimensions he brings to well, understanding I think, movies. I think the great directors, and I think there have only been a handful of them in the history of film, are able to do that. They're able to bring a world that they create onto film and keep it all in their mind as they're making the movie. It's a tremendously difficult job. Um, the, the best analogy I've, I've heard for directing a movie, it's like trying to direct a war yeah. in the middle of bullets flying and uh, attrition and uh, supply lines failing and, yeah. and people not coming out of their trailers. I mean, it's you're, you're up against the elements. So. And what they love, people seem to love, is the sense of control it gives, the, the capacity you have of, of, of creating the control. final authority. And, and of making really. your vision uh, concrete and yeah. seeing it come to life. So I said that, that your first love might be novels. I mean, are you, in, in the end, what sort of flows through a lot of what you do beyond the creative impulse is, the, is, the, is writing. Yeah, and I began as a writer. I started writing novels at the age of 11 and wrote three. 11? Yeah, 11. I, I wrote three before I was 15 and then turned to playwriting and then uh, eventually I was seduced by show business. But uh, I've gone back to, uh, to novels now yeah. as the writing sentences that people are actually going to read and crafting them for the pleasure of how they sound as you work on them. Was it hard to go back? I mean, when you went back to do this, was it more difficult because you had gone out and done these other things and you had so many more distractions? No, I was able to actually block those out, and I think those things contributed to my being able to write a, a novel that was more pleasing to me. I mean, you write screenplays and plays, you learn how to write dialogue, you develop an ear, you develop a visual sense as a director. All those things contribute to the skills you need to, to write a book. Did, did you do it all at one setting? I mean, in a sense, did you go and block out six months of time or a year of time? Precisely, to do it? yeah. I, that was the only way I could see to do it, was to really commit myself to this one task for a nine-month period. What's the story? The story is about Arthur Conan Doyle, um, right. the uh, famous as the creator Sherlock. of Sherlock Holmes, but in his own time, famous for many other things as well. That's all we remember him for now. Uh, I pick him up at the age of 25 as a young physician, a kind of failed physician living in London. His other um, sort of uh, uh, guiding interest in, in life was in the paranormal, in the supernatural, and mm -hmm. the spiritualist movement, which is also an interest of mine. So he seemed to be a perfect vehicle for telling a story that I could relate to. And the idea is that he meets a man who will become the inspiration for Sherlock Holmes, um, who claims to be a secret agent for Queen Victoria, but may in fact be an escaped lunatic. Yeah. and um, is drawn into it um, by being invited to a seance that in fact turns into a murderous engagement in which a mysterious cabal of people are trying to kill him, perhaps, and uh, the, the Holmes figure rescues him and takes him off on an adventure. What would shock me anyway. about your interest in parapsychology and, I mean, what mm. do you believe that I might say, my God, Frost is way the hell off the edge. Oh, there's a lot of stuff. I mean, do I've you been, believe? Yeah. Well, I'm, you see, I'm, uh, why I like Doyle is that he didn't really become a believer until his dead son appeared to him at a seance after for the First World War. I haven't had that experience. Have you had yet. any seance experience? I've had seance experiences, but nothing that's persuaded me utterly that this is for real. Not, but nothing has persuaded me that it isn't. And I'm still in. Uh, but what's the closest thing that persuades you that you have had as an experience? All right. I had a, a, a Ouija board come to life in my hand. At a, at a seance that absolutely terrified me. Well, That's something, well, tell us. Well, you know, a Ouija board is, is you, you've got two people sitting across the table right. and you put your fingers in this little thing they call a planchette. Yeah. And it's got a little thing in the center that focuses over letters as it right. moves around. Right. So uh, this girl I was sitting across from had her eyes closed and I was not moving it. And this thing was moving at such a rate that I was calling out the letters without knowing what the words were. You so we're not watching the board, and as it moved to a certain letter, you could tell what you want. What yeah, it would f stop in the letter, I would call it out, someone would write it down, and then they would chop it up into words later on. Now, I was with a bunch of people at the Guthrie Theater in Minneapolis, yeah. and what made contact with us was uh, 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 something that identified itself as the spirit of an usher who had committed suicide the year before in the parking lot outside the theater. And he said, th or things were said or communicated in this session that were known to the people who were in the room with me, that were things only this guy could have known. So, what happens when we die, in your judgment? I think that there is a continuity of consciousness that lives beyond the physical body, that goes to another 
plane of existence that's beyond our ability to comprehend at this moment in time. And uh, I don't know why, I don't know where that plane is. And, and what does that spirit know about, you know, I mean, are people who are dead, put it in my simple language, yeah. are there people who are dead who can look down on us in our life and see how we're doing? It is said that there are. It is also said that life is a school and that we are working our way towards the upper classes <laughs> and eventual graduation of some sort and that... Um, yeah. No wonder uh, you and Lynch got along yeah, so well. Yeah, we got along pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> the book is called The List of Seven, a novel by Mark Frost. Thank you very much. My, my pleasure to be here. Thanks. Thank you for joining us this evening. We'll see you next time.